is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. What happens to our ideas of the present when we shift our perspective on the past? For many of us, the presidency of Ronald Reagan tells us everything we need to know about the man and his brand of Republican politics. But historian Rick Perlstein argues that we'll find a lot more by turning the clock back 20 years and further in his book, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. And for New York University professor Lawrence Schiffman, embracing Jewish tradition has meant going back more than 2,000 years to a period before the rabbinic Judaism we've known for so long. Embracing what we have to learn from Second Temple Judaism, Schiffman is co-editor of the new three-volume work, Outside the Bible, Ancient Jewish Writings Related to Scripture. But first, here's my interview with Rick Perlstein. When we think of a lot of presidents, we can just think of them as presidents. There isn't a whole lot of prior life to Barack Obama or Bill Clinton uh -huh. or George W. Bush or, I mean, even to a degree, George H. W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, that you think, wow, we really need to study these people to understand their national impact. But yeah. for Ronald Reagan, he was very much affecting the national discourse decades before right. he was ever elected it's president. True. He was a public figure since the 1930s. He came to Hollywood in 1937. But even before that, he was a pretty famous guy in the Midwest because he had been a radio announcer uh, at a very big 50,000 watt station in Iowa and he broadcast the Cubs games. And that, they were really a regional team. There was no baseball team in Iowa, right? Uh, and so big in Iowa. He was not only big in Iowa, he was big in Illinois, he was big in Wisconsin, you know, he was big in Michigan, right? Um, and people knew who he was. And yeah, and then sort of he um, becomes uh, really most famous uh, in the 19. 50s when he becomes a spokesman for General Electric, right? And he's on TV every Sunday in this top-rated anthology show on commercials for GE. There's this really funny joke about his work for GE. You know, he, he would kind of advertise the, the noble things GE was doing in national defense and et cetera. Uh, I didn't, he was such a good salesman, right? So someone said, the joke is, Someone said, uh, I didn't know I needed a nuclear submarine, but I've been watching a lot of Ronald Reagan, and now I have one. My first exposure to the pre-1980s Ronald Reagan yeah. history, as a teenager listening to the, the Woodstock concert on a CD, uh -huh. and, the, and uh, one of the singers in, you know, says, this song goes out to Ronald Ray Gunn. Ray Gunn, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I said, why does someone in 1969 care about Ronald Reagan? Interesting. You know? And uh, as a teenager uh, who, you know, grew up in the 80s, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really know about this period in the 60s where, where, where he did so much, uh, but he was a, a, extremely yes, and that's how he became a national figure. It was kind of hating on uh, the student protests of the 1960s, um, and it really showed his kind of political acumen, right? So the big worry that his aides had when he was running for president in 1966 was he was an actor. He wouldn't be seen as smart. He was in a movie with a chimpanzee. We all know these stories. And so they wanted to actually have him announce his candidacy uh, with two Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winning Berkeley scientists next to him. He's smart, right? And uh, then he started attacking Berkeley on the stump and saying kids should obey the rules or get out. Right, are saying that these kids were given this education that a lot of you never had the chance to have, and they're just spitting on it. And his aides are like, "Stop it! Don't you know our polls don't show anyone, you know, raising Berkeley as their most important issue." And he, which is funny because a lot of people misinterpret him as kind of just a product of his handlers. He said, "I don't care what the polls say. Anytime someone even asks me a question about Berkeley when I'm on the road, there's a standing ovation." He kind of could feel the room. He could, f and the reason it didn't show up in their polls is because no politician had really thought to articulate it as a political issue, something that you could cast a vote for or against, right? And his skill was you kind of inventing that as a political issue. And and then what he becomes is this is kind of like the Tea Party of today, mm -hmm. or to a degree, uh, the various Republican insurgents. Uh, this this populist Republican right, figure who's taking says, on the establishment. Ronald Reagan uh, gave this speech at the the second conservative political action conference, CPAC. They still have him, and he said, "We need a Republican Party that's not a pale echo of the other side. No pale pastels," was what he said. And the pundits were baffled. They were like, "How can you?" increased the size and power of the Republican Party, which was really on the ropes because of Watergate. Only 18% of Americans called themselves Republicans. How can you expand that 18% without building a big tent? But Reagan is saying, no, we need to purify our message. And now, taking Judaism back to the days before the Talmud, NYU professor Lawrence Schiffman. When you look at more or less these texts that the Jewish community decided not to keep around anymore, 
uh, or, or not to continue copying, not to continue reading in synagogue and what have you. Uh, what are some of the most surprising things in terms of how, how the average person perceives Judaism today? I think the surprising thing is to find out that a lot of the same kinds of issues that we talk about today existed in ancient times. So you had Jews of varying degrees of observance. You had all types of different opinions about Jewish law and practice, and some of these are alluded to in the Talmud and Josephus, but here they come alive in ways that they could never possibly have come alive. A lot of these texts are preserved in a sense by the Christian community. That there is an uh, that Christians felt like these texts were more worth hanging on to than ultimately the Jewish community. Yeah, this is that, amazing. that 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 the you know at more or less by the time the Jews decide to canonize their Bible, uh, they're cutting out a lot of Jewish texts. There's a midrashic statement that anybody who brings more than 24 books into his house is bringing in a tumult that you shouldn't even have any of these books. And the only books you should have are the books of the Bible. Now, also we have to understand that some of this was engendered by the early rabbinic idea of oral law, that it's not permitted to have the so-called oral law put into writing. So that's why they oppose books. But in some cases, the books do have disagreements with rabbinic principle. What I think is amazing is how many of these books have so many parallels with rabbinic literature that it's obvious that rabbinic midrash comes to a great extent out of the same culture as some of the biblical interpretation that we have in 2nd century BCE, 1st century BCE. And this shows that overall, that kind of intellectual patterns floating around. And so we would only be understanding a part of it with the literature that was traditionally passed on. In contrast to this extremely large uh, three volume set, you, you've published one very thin book, uh, right. Who Was a Jew? Which I think is an instructive um, on, on, on this question that, that I think plagues Jewish Christian, relation, Jewish Christian relations today and perhaps forever, uh, that, uh, that fundamentally, you know, the Jews somehow decided uh, we're, gonna rege we're rejecting Jesus, and almost from day one, that, that, that this is the, the popular conception. But what you've shown, and I think what these texts also reveal, is that this was a much more gradual process in which these communities just kind of grew apart. But you can trace in Christian literature and the reflection in Jewish literature, how they start to become enemies. And uh, I think we have to understand that also for Jews, as Christianity adopted two particular concepts, Jews found themselves rejecting it more and more. And those were the concept that Jesus actually was the Messiah, but at the same time that he could somehow or another be the Son of God. Jews found this impossible to, to accept. And then at the same time, Jews found it impossible to accept that this person would somehow provide an alternative, you might say path, to heaven than that of observing the Torah. And the notion that at least was placed on Jesus by Paul, even if he himself would not have agreed to this, that Jesus' life substitutes for having to observe the Torah's commandments was for Jews completely unacceptable. So that these theological and practical beliefs did bring about the fact that Jews had no choice not to reject Jesus, but to reflect, reject the teachings of Christianity. Christians focus on the rejection of Jesus as if somehow or another the Jews wanted to get rid of this guy because of what he was teaching. Most of what he teaches sounds like Judaism. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Link Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on the Jewish channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.